Okay, welcome to the uh, October 8th edition of the Altamesa Center for the Arts reading series. We're thrilled today to host uh, four fantastic poets and artists who will talk about uh, uh, the, the, the interconnection between the dialogue, uh, the interconnection between the visual and the poetic, and they will say it much more <laughs> clearly than I will. And the Alta Mesa Center for the Arts is an interfaith arts and spirituality hub housed within and sponsored by Orinda Community Church. We believe that art is a spiritual act and a human right. We wish to provide a space where people from diverse traditions, artistic practices, and economic realities can come together in community. We know that art can bridge the divisions, substantive and arbitrary, that divide us. We come together not only to practice and teach the arts, but to celebrate and learn from our differences and to foster lively and respectful interdisciplinary dialogues. We seek unity in diversity. So wherever you are on your artistic or your spiritual journey, whoever you are, you are welcome here. Our readers today are Jennifer S. Ching, whose work includes poetry, lyric essays, imaged text forms. She's the author of Moon, Letters, Maps, Poems from Tarlapin Sky, which was named the Publishers Weekly Best Book of Poetry, and House, uh, Omnidon 2016, which was selected by Claudia Ren King for the Omnidon Poetry Book. Having grown up in Texas and Hong Kong, she now lives in San Francisco. And as many of our readers have told us, if you hear a grand whooshing sound above, I think the Blue Angels are flying over. So we'll just have to forgive them for that. Heidi Van Horn is a poet, editor, and book designer. She's the author of Belated Poem from Drop Leaf Press and co-creator with David McKenna Kwan of House of David a poetic assemblage exploring the personal and political geography of mass incarceration. She was raised and still lives in the San Francisco Bay Area, where she is co-editor of Jop Leaf Press, a woman-run poetry collective, and a founding member of The Ruby, a gathering place for women and non-binary artists. Sarah Rosenthal is the author of Estelle, meaning star, the one follows another, experiments in dance, art, and life through the lens of Simone Forti and Yvonne Rainier. Her short film, We Agree on the Sun, has received numerous accolades on the film festival circuit, including Best Experimental Short in the 2001 Berlin Independent Film Festival. She too lives in San Francisco, where she manages projects for the Center for Collaborative Classroom, works as a life and professional coach, and serves on the California Book Award for Poetry Journey uh, Jury. Maud um, Tan Swai is a visual artist and writer whose work combines intricately detailed pandemic drawings and paintings of biometric structures, events, and processes with sources and texts and po uh, of texts and poetry. She received a BA from the University of California, Berkeley. She grew up in suburban Detroit and currently lives in Ojai, uh, California. Uh, this is a remarkable event uh, because it's kind of what we've been trying to do the whole time, not quite managing to do it. And that is bring artists to the end of conversation from diverse practices and diverse backgrounds to really talk about the alchemical process by which we discover and respond to each other's work how those responses inspire and deepen and broaden our process as an artist and as consumers of art. And that terrible word consumer, I think, if you think of it as in terms of nourishment, what you take in is part of what you get out of yourself. Um, it might be a, a more positive connotation. I'm gonna turn uh, the mic over now to Heidi, who's going to explain the history of this collaboration uh, and how we've come here today. So thank you for your presence here. Uh, you're welcome to use the chat if you like, and any questions that you have, we will have time at the end to address. Again, thank you for your presence and Heidi. Thank you. Hi everyone, um, it's so great to be here. Um, thank you, Mary, for hosting and to all of you for joining. Um, to start out, I've been tasked with sharing a few details about how some of these creative partnerships came about. And 
Um, then I'll talk a bit about how I used images in my own work as an editor and a curator of text image books. Um, it's really uh, actually a pleasure and an honor um, to talk about all these connections. Um, Maude and I have known each other since the early 90s when we met in the AmeriCorps program at UC Berkeley. Um, much of our focus at that time was centered around social justice, um, but like most college students and recent graduates, we'd yet to figure out how these concerns would manifest themselves in the real world. As the years passed, um, we supported each other and we continue to support each other um, as we both developed an artistic practice, Maude as a visual artist and myself as a writer. Maude's art um, incorporates the written word and is very quite preoccupied with language. Um, and it has felt like there's a refractional symmetry um, because my writing integrates photography and other visual elements. Um, my deep friendship and admiration for Jen was forged in the poetry MFA program at San Francisco State. As her classmate, I witnessed the evolution of her first book, House A, which astonished me with its brilliance and heart. Present day, with three other writers, Jen and I co-edit Drop Leaf Press, an all-female collective. And Jen and I continue to support each other as weird mom poets, as my 14-year-old calls us, and just generally as people who don't leave the house very much. Um, I was thrilled when she reached out to Maude, another person who tends towards the antisocial, her cover art for her second book, Moon, Maps, Letters, Poems. I first encountered Sarah's work over a decade ago in her 2010 anthology, A Community Writing Itself, Conversations with Vanguard Writers of the Bay Area. These generous and generative interviews provided a literary and geographical grounding for me. And as I was getting started as a writer, I returned to them again and again. So it felt like a homecoming to work with Sarah as her editor for Drop Leaf Press as she crafted the chapbook, We Could Hang a Radical Panel of Light from her full length manuscript, Estelle Meaning Star. In an interview, Sarah described this project created from a dream-based pool of language as making way for the aesthetic, 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 aesthetic and the divine. It is perhaps for this reason and the ability of both of these artists to transform bodily-based narratives into something divine that I suggested Maud's work for the cover of Sarah's book. Now I'm going to switch gears and talk briefly about another collaboration. Although I use text image, mostly my own photography, in my own writing, it felt more resonant to share, uh, share thoughts and pages from my curatorial role in another drop leaf project called All of It Tinged, a juxtaposition of the photography of Asako Shimazaki and the writing of Diana Fisher. It was a strange and out of the blue idea to pair Asako's images from her solo wanderings across Northern Japan with Diana's narrative about a novitiate and her convent absorbing the results of a catastrophic national election. But, but both Asako and Diana also felt the uncanny affinity and that, adjacent, and that adjacency might add new layers of meaning and resonance to both bodies of work. It looks like I'll only have time to read a few pages, but Mary's been kind enough to offer to scroll through the images in the book. Um, and as I'm reading, you'll see uh, a few of the trails, garden paths, stairs, covered bridges, and doorways in Asako's photographs. Asako is here, actually, so <laughs> exciting to have her with us today. Um, and how they lead to white space and dark apertures. The space between in these photographs comes alive. To exist in liminality is to exist at their threshold. Like Mary David, the narrator of uh, Diana's narrative, missives to God, these images are oracular and otherworldly. And both of these artists are engaged 
in a sustained, earnest, passionate inquiry into the nature of faith in the face of catastrophe, which is also the nature of human connectedness. So I'll read from a little, I'll read a little bit from that now, and then um, I'll have a few more things to say before I pass, pass the floor to Jen. There is a space of waiting between wanting to know and knowing. That moment of not knowing is like sitting with an animal in the rain. I cannot find Lumen's bones. I do not know why, but during the night after the country had spoken its will and I lay in bed reading the Psalms to quiet my heart, I remembered him. I used to have his cage by the window, shielded from the breeze with a piece of broadcloth. And when he sang, he lifted the tip of his beak toward the ceiling, El Cielo, and you could see the whole of him tense with the song filling his tiny body. The song seemed to begin from where he touched the earth with earnestness, in his little claws clinging fast to the perch, then the sound, El Sonido, lunging upward through the entire crescent of his torso, through the fragile cage of his ribs, home to the beat of his heart, smaller than a bean. The notes climbed in spirals, la espiral, inspiras, each note as taut as water held in a bowl. The last I opened the tin, I picked up his skull between my forefinger and thumb. It was a tiny bud like a rose, fisted and crushed on one side. The bones were petal thin and flaked like old paper. Have mercy on us, have mercy on us, have mercy on us. That was Marie Claire whispering in the bed next to mine. I pray you will help me find them. They are in a tea tin lined with a cotton napkin where I placed his body just after he died of a cough. His little body was still limp and just the side of the inside of my palm. I have looked under my bed and in the bottom of the dresser I share with Agatha Grace, who uses the top three. I have not had time to look anywhere else, and it was only last evening that the results came in. Marie Claire had finally fallen asleep. The last I saw of Agatha Grace was at dinner. Proctor Silas was visiting. He sometimes does, and some say too often, and after drinking his second or third cup of mulled wine, his cheeks were roseate with the flush of good cheer, filling in the tracery of broken vessels so they became invisible. He said he did not see any need to check on the results as it was a given, and Mother Anne said it should not bad matter to anyone here who won. She looked around the room steadily, her face framed by the white envelope we wear always seems to suggest that she scrubs the rest of her as well as her face in the shock of cold water before vigils every morning. Her eyes paused on mine, then on Marie Claire, then she looked down. I'll, I'll just finish up with a couple more comments about this collaboration. Echoing Mary, Mary David's solitude, Asako's images are unpeopled except for one exception in which the distance between human beings couldn't be starker. Yet the, yet the connection between the moment of composition and our viewing of these photographs could not be more intimate. Both of these bodies of work are so much about boundlessness and boundedness. They interrogate and register in relation to each other drawing us into relationship with others, and in doing so with ourselves. Thank you so much. On that note, I'll pass the floor to my dear friend, Jen. Thank you, Heidi. That was beautiful. Um, let me go ahead and share my screen. Do you all see that OK? Yeah, OK. Um, so even though uh, sections of my work in general incorporate image and text, um, for the purposes of today, I'm going to focus on my collaboration with 
with Maud's cover art for my second book, Moon Letters, Maps, Poems. Um, I was already, as Heidi mentioned, I had met Maud through Heidi, and so I was already familiar with Maud's work and always immediately felt immensely pulled to her ink drawings and watercolor paintings. Um, there's a, a strong poetic quality to her work, I think, even in how her artistic modes literally merge uh, lineation and fluidity. Um, there is a just a really deep sense of attunement, um, of precision and clarity, this really deep and intimate uh, attenuation. And simultaneously, I think there is a sense of wilderness and a shadowy unsayability. Um, to me, her work carries both cellular and cosmic evocations. Um, and her 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 paintings and her drawings, I think, resonate in these ways, not only with my writing practice, but with um, how I feel like it is to be in the world and to navigate the world. Um, and it felt particularly in kinship with uh, my book, Moon. Um, so to tell you a little bit about that work, um, it's a hybrid book. It kind of amalgamates mythology and autofiction and poetry together. It centers on the, the concept of the feminine monstrous, um, and in particular traces a sort of woman's unbuilding and rebuilding of selfhood and worlds. Um, so I think you can kind of already almost see even just with the cover art that there are these echoes uh, between with, you know, with these to me, these evocations in Maud's work of bodily structures and also dense forests and root systems, um, limbic branches, labyrinths of fibers and flora. Um, I wanted to switch over to this image. This is These are actually postcards that I made for my book launch. Um, and they contain, again, uh, Maud's artwork in conjunction with some of the text from the book. Um, so the book draws loosely on various Chinese mythologies about women, particularly that of Tang E, the Lady in the Moon, which is a story about um, a woman who begins on earth and then floats to the moon. And in this journey, she leaves behind her husband. And in different versions, in various versions, she's either a moon goddess or a thief or sometimes an innocent bystander who didn't know what she was doing. Um, but the what I'm interested in in the book is kind of both honoring and disrupting these stories and really just writing into their, their underbellies and their shadow stories. So there's a way I think in which Maud's work, um, there's just this kinship with the, the sense of feminine intimacy and world building um, body and wilderness, destruction and creation. Um, this, yeah, I feel they feel like kindred spirits, her work in this book, um, not only in thematic terms, but also in the book's approach to language and form, which is a big uh, kind of undercurrent in the, the book's narr narrative. Um, so I'll read a few poems from the book, the last section, which is, these are all prose poems from the voice of Tang e, the lady in the moon. Some mornings when I wake, I know that in my sleep, I have been weaving a net around my body, like fish hefted in from ocean waves, or a way to catch a fallen starling. I never wanted a world clear as ether. Instead, I wanted a faraway sky to press my body up against, a boundary ever to push away. On the stairs, as I made my way down to the ground, I saw that there were moths of all sizes stuck to the wall, small and large, but always flat, as if cut carefully from an old paper bag. All day, I kept hearing metaphors, migrating salmon, nocturnal tides, the return of planetary bodies. When I say moon, I almost never mean the moon. When I say moon, I mean the light of the sky is about to disappear behind the beached ocean, and I cannot hold it anymore. It is spilling between my fingers. When I say to you it is a strange moon day, 
You should know I mean the unsettling of our underbellies strewn across such rigorous comings and goings. If I were more careful, the dishes would not be chipped, the tub not a discolored rust. At various times during the day, I find the light too meager, too hesitant or otherwise possessed. I move from room to room as if to monitor my body's absorption of external particles, but really I am drawn to what I cannot name, the slant of light, a brief home for this patch of skin. Outside, I can see clusters of sturdy green leaves emerging from the underground, trembling and waving recklessly as if prickled by a self-assured wind. Underwater, their movements would resemble swimming. If he eclipses me in my own house, if he haunts my movement like a shadow to ground an unknown desire, if he notices habitual wounds, household failures, but says nothing, then I will plant a garden of creeping winter, walking onion, orris root, their stalks able to reach sky-shaped distances, their leaves unafraid to impress on the skin. I am grateful for the odd unruly pine, its limbs so sprawling it cannot be held by a metal wire. I am grateful for tree bark that flakes into moths, for dandelion spores that swims upward straight through earthly branches, never caught, never landing. In the avoidance of all things earthly, I hoped for some clouds with which to eclipse the ground. I monitored the low sound of the earth splitting instead of the depth of cavity it promised to carve. There is salt where salt does not belong, and a wound grows. It is thrush with branches I nevertheless tend. If I keep the succulent in the sun where its leaves turn redder still, there might still be something left over for me. Um, and then lastly, before I end, I, I just wanted to um, mention how the, the process of converging mods art, cover art, with my book felt um, really integral and important to the artifact of the book. Um, and it also felt like a, a really natural and organic extension um, of even my own writing process where I follow my intuition in bringing two different utterances into proximal space um, and just kind of allow that third you know, space of meaning to, to be ruptured open and for ghostly echoes to be conjured there. Um, and I wanted to share this image just because I love it so much. Um, the, le the right part is a photo I took years ago on a walk um, and I was just really enjoying the way that the lichen was blooming in the shadow of my body. Um, and then, you know, many years later, I think I noticed that Maud's uh, artwork in particular in this, this postcard, to me, there's a really uncanny sort of translation happening here um, that also felt very kindred spirit with uh, the book. And I just... I love it and I wanted to share that image. <laughs> um, so that's it for me. I'm going to hand it now over to Sarah. Great. Um, let me just rearrange a few things here. Um, screen real estate. So, um, Thank you. First of all, thank you, Mary, for hosting. I think we are so fortunate as lovers of literature that a novelist of your talent um, carves out time to host this tremendous reading and discussion series. Um, I've attended other events and they're just always really riveting and I learn a lot and, and um, it's very generous of you. Um, it's such a privilege to join with Heidi and Jennifer and Maud, all of whose work and presence in the world is so inspiring to me. And thank you so much to our lovely audience for joining us today. Um, so um, we could hang a radical panel of light, which is the chapbook that Maud's art appears on the cover of. Um, 
comprises cut-ups using found text, which in this particular instance was my own dream journals from a period when I was undergoing treatment for cancer. And um, the it's, a, it's an excerpt actually from a full length collection titled Estelle Meaning Star, which is forthcoming um, in spring 2024 from Chax Press. So just briefly, why cut-ups? Um, I'm always looking for ways to circumvent intentionality in my writing um, because I wanna access things my small sense of self, my ego doesn't know yet and wouldn't dare attempt. <laughs> um, and in this case, circumventing intentionality meant performing various operations on a pool of dream language in order to arrive at poems. And the operations were very physical. I mean, literally cutting and pasting and arranging and gluing down tiny, tiny pieces of paper. Um, partly because I'm entranced by visual artists' process, the way their hands and eyes and bodies are so involved in art making. Um, when I've been on residencies, one of my favorite, favorite parts is the studio walks where each artist shows you their materials and explains what they're making. And it's just so darn visceral. Um, and I wanted that materiality and embodiment in part because I recognized that getting caught up in the intense physicality of the process was another way to distract my mind from tired thoughts and tropes. And also in retrospect was perhaps a way of celebrating just being in a body in a, in a really positive way um, rather than in a, you know, very suffering body. Um, I knew we needed a cover that somehow conveyed a radical panel of light. And um, I pictured some kind of abstract spreading golden element that was kind of as far as I had gotten. And then Heidi um, brought Ma's work to my attention and I felt an immediate yes. Um, and as I further explored Maud's body of work, I discovered that some of her art deals with found text, which felt simpatico to me. And the texts that I saw in Maud's work refer to intensely challenging physical and mental states and the perhaps inevitable questions about life and death that those kinds of states invoke. Um, the art of hers that I saw dives into these circumstances and places issues of extremity and mortality within images that evoke nature and its cycles. And for me, her images braid together a grounded calm with a sense of provisionality in a way that I find riveting. Um, and the combination of this sense of physical and or mental distress with a celebration of beauty and an even ecstatic reveling in presence felt like a, an amazing match for the chapbook. Um, side note, I'm really fascinated by the ways that Jennifer and my descriptions of <laughs> Maud's art overlap and diverge. And I just... Um, I think that it's a sign of the richness of Maud's art um, that it lends itself to such different descriptions. Um, regarding the we in We Could Hang a Radical Panel of Light, I think of featuring Maud's art on the cover as a profound after the fact collaboration. Um, and again, Jennifer referenced the same feeling because on the one hand, Maud made it while fully immersed in her own preoccupations, right? We'd never heard of each other when she painted it. And it was, I believe part, it was part of a series. I think we might see another image related to that series. Um, yet on the other hand, the painting can be seen as a fully realized enactment of what a radical panel of light could be. It emanates this wild and luminous beauty. And hang on to your hats. I'm gonna show it to you really soon. Um, and the we is there for me too when I think about Heidi's remarkable gift for sensing into these possible matches and bringing creators together, as well as her, you know, own own practice, her, her Heidi's um, Heidi's we within her own practice because her her visual art and her writing collaborate together, and um, 
and 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 as well there's a we in um her and Maud's eagerness to obsess over the smallest details of putting together this chapbook down to matching the thread used in the binding to the yellow in the painting um not to mention all the amazing support that Jennifer and all of the other drop leaf press editors contributed so this chapbook project became very much of a we for me and that's one of my favorite things is the we. Um, so with that, I'm going to share the cover and read a few poems. Just keeping on the time here. Oh, you know what, let me. So just wanting to give you a moment to sort of absorb this as um, what a radical panel of light might be. And then I'll just read a few poems. Um, discussion, looking out from balcony, a droplet of wine in my palm. Everyone needs a new name because we're all stars. No, because we're another self positioning. My name is Estelle. I turn on my center. Speech freezes. My name is tentatively she who. She who assume the situation is playable. Try at least, I'm trying not to, I'm trying to appear, Estelle meaning star. Meaning star, trauma table, conversation. All names are different versions of the word star, points and brilliance, bodies conferring against a glassy black. A folded thing to her and more imparts the dictates of night. Tell them I've done it a zillion times. I run at night straight through the danger. Dance learners appears there are two, three, but stare at this number one. Wounded it keeps trying to charge the rest of us. Over initial shock, girls think it's their job to inch closer, pick it up, place it under the table. The dog is, well, it's here, they told me. This pain stretches the length of a body, force myself to steady. Stay, I, stay, I, stay. 150 broken down years, broken number now, deads and improvised happening. Won't be meeting legs, elbows, earnest heart. I should feel more left out, but I... Torn time, I've thanked the thin line that showed skin a world. I think I'll stop there. So let me just segue here in a second. Okay, so what I would like to do is now turn it over to Maud and ask you, Maud, if you can talk about your experience as an artist working with writers and also how you incorporate language into your own work. Thank you, Sarah. Excuse my voice, I'm just getting over a cold. <laughs> um, let's see, working with writers has been an absolutely just unbelievably seamless and inspiring process. I mean, I, I, I don't know how else to describe it other than the, the fact that it's been so easy and has felt so organic, um, I think is a word that Jen used. and. Um, I attribute a lot of that to the extraordinary attention that each of these writers brings to their work and to their 
interactions with um, the world and to all of their relationships, um, as well as a, um, brilliance, which is a word that Heidi used, um, just bringing so much light to every moment and, and my life uh, in particular. Um, it's, it's really been this incredible network and community in my heart and in my mind and through the years, um, just to know that, you know, there are these incredible writers and souls who see my work and who believe in my work and, um, and the fact that there's so much synchronicity and um, kinship is, has been overwhelming, I have to say, and um, I don't have the right words. I think that I will never match what you all have said today. <laughs> Um, as far as, um, you know, the relationship between the images and the words. Um, I've personally been building my own lexicon um, to try to capture um, my relationship with visual art and with my work and with the way that I see the world and have experienced the world um, on so many levels. And um, I feel like my art is, has been an, a constant attempt to um, verbalize what I feel. Um, and so I've used words as inspiration um, from other texts, from found text, um, and also um, my own um, words, which have come a lot from um, things like uh, vintage medical dictionaries, um, as well as my own medical records um, having to do with my own body. Um, and I've attempted to marry all of the above as far as the spiritual and um, the physiological and <clears throat> the emotional. Um, so I thought that I would show some of my work. Actually, I wanted to show you a tool that I use to um, just so you have an idea of what I'm referring to. This is not the actual Coifle and Esser tool, but they did develop them mid-century um, in order to do some of the stenciling work. Um, and this helps you put this into um, um, a, a ruler that has the letters on it. So it requires intense focus and, um, and a lot of time. <laughs> so you'll see on, in some of the pieces, I do use the lettering. And um, I was going to go ahead and just show you a slideshow and then also read from a piece that I wrote called Auto Anamnesis um, that sort of encapsulates a lot of the work that I've done around my body and around physiology. And I, I like to call it my autobiology. Um, so with that, I'll go ahead and share my screen. Okay, can everybody see that? Okay, wonderful. Um, so I'll read, I guess I'll read the whole piece. It's Autoanamnesis Part One, Lexicon of a Truant Mind-Body Assemblage, or a Harvest. Harrow and thresh the intervening spaces, dissect a lifetime of pattern recognition, a nocturnal trait, a path in a, anomic sign, a compulsion, systemic and wolf-like, swelling in vivo, in this vivo, signaling the time for raised hairs, distally oriented and ever susceptible, measuring sensitivities and imposing suppression, marking the usual identifiers relentlessly. Infiltrate, the tension of perception, of misgiving, of disquiet, of foreboding and alarm, the comfort of familiar angst, an obvious premonition foretold, an om ominous anticipation unfolds. Tension begetting tension, begetting tension, begetting tension, begets release. Transgress with clouded mentation, raw, angry fle flesh, exposed, oozing and laid bare to a side-splitting collective gasp. Comicality beyond measure, beyond chagrin. The indignity of being, persistent, endemitous, quiescent, and necrotic. Paradolic articulation through a thousand corroded wounds. Autoanamnesis part two. 
lexicon of a plenary body-mind assemblage or a resolution. Heroin thresh the filamental, chelate a lifetime of encounters, of informed consent, of assumed risks, of tracing antibodies and waiving rights, while unknown processes persist under aseptic military rule. Reconcile foreign bodies, limbic tension, shrouded deformities, nonsense mediated decay, and the value of sedimentation, where prototypical morphinian effects meet the fixed ends of op opiophagy. Remediate proselytized pathology and ritualized pain, excise sanguineous sideways glances, exercise the catechized free radicals, ramify the thews and sinews, infuse light intracellular, then alkalinize his heart beyond a specific gravity and flow silent beyond belief. The sudden dignity of being, delicate, delightful, paroxysmal, fluid, and clear. Svota from wounds of experience. So, so that's um, that in a nutshell should represent my body of work up to this point. Um, and I was speaking to Sarah before the the event and um, she mentioned, I have to disclose that I've been fairly consumed with motherhood for the past three years since the pandemic hit. My daughter was born literally at the beginning of the pandemic and we went into lockdown uh, right when she came home. Um, so a lot of my thoughts and focus have been on parenting and um, we, we, Sarah talked about um, accessing creativity and art through parenting. And I realize it's all part of the same process, finding that flow and that intense attention um, that we bring to our work and the light and the joy. And um, I just am so honored and humbled to be part of this group today. And thank you for all of the opportunities um, to being out in the world uh, in this manner. It feels very comfortable and very um, inspirational and, and very safe as well. So um, thank you very much. And um, yeah, <laughs> I'll hand it over back to Sarah. Oh. Yeah, thank you, Maud, that was so beautiful. Um, and I, I loved hearing your, um, your autobiology. What a brilliant word. Mm -hmm. um mary i th what what's what, what are we doing now i think yeah well we have we have some time i'm sure there's questions i'm sure this is going to inspire some um good conversation too among us so if there's a question in the group uh you have you can turn your uh, mute off you can ask it in the chat um while you're thinking i i'm curious about a word i think jennifer used in the beginning that seems to relate to all your work, and that is attunement. Um, and in some of my writing, I've been looking at the notion and contrasting atonement and attunement um, as two complementary ways of coming into harmony with both the past and the present, but also forming a, some sort of some sort of harmonious future. Um, Maybe, maybe Jen, was it you, Jennifer, who who used that word? Would you speak a little bit more about your understanding of that? And if anyone else too has a comment on it, even in the in the gallery, I'd, I'd love to hear it. And in the meantime, use the chat or or just come on and ask your question. Um, I don't know if I have anything super formulated, but um, I was teaching a class yesterday, and most of the 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 teaching work that I've been doing, I've been focusing very much on this idea of bewilderment as um, mm -hmm. which is Fanny Howe's uh, term, not only as a poetics, but as an ethics. And I think part of that orientation of the body to to be in bewilderment, hand in hand, I think goes with this idea of mm -hmm orienting the body to this uh, 
place or location of attunement and attention and attending to and attenuation and care. Um, I think that I'm really interested, especially in the last few years, especially as a new mother, um, with the intersection between poetry and arts and attention and care. Um, and I think just the ways you mentioned, like how it sort of brings together past and present. And I think I'm also thinking about how there's a way in which it brings together um, sort of it, I guess what I'm thinking about is I, in conjunction with bewilderment, I think about uh, the Japanese aesthetic concept of wabi-sabi and how, you know, on the one hand, there's there's like the thing that is incomplete and ephemeral and imperfect and flawed, um, which is so much of our experience of the body and the world. And at the same time, there is this idea of beauty and meaning making coming from the process of just attention and intimacy and vulnerability and um, and what is unsayable and what's unknowable. So some sort of like materiality and immateriality, I think is what I'm thinking mm -hmm. of. Um, I, I could jump on there a little tiny bit. Oh, hi, Dave. I didn't know my brother was here. <laughs> um, um, I, Jennifer, your ideas sprang some, a little bit of further thinking, um, some tendrils. Um, I really appreciated your putting the words attunement and bewilderment and attention and care all in the same paragraph. And um, in terms of what I see amongst the people on this panel, I see four artists, writer, people, creators um, who, who work, collab I mentioned this in relation to Jenna or to Heidi, work collaboratively with ourselves. So within our own art practice, we're we're collaborating, we're, 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 we're putting ourselves in a state of bewilderment and curiosity and placing things next to each other to find something out and to see what will happen and to be surprised and to let, I think what Jennifer said, the third thing come, come mm. into being. And so we're doing that in our own practices. And so in a way, I think that whether it's causal or not, we are inclined to seek out to, to embrace or be open to these collaborations between artists as well. Um, and so we're accustomed not only to embracing bewilderment, but to this attunement, like how might these things go together? Um, or how might the ways that they don't go together be productive. <laughs> um, and I think that another really unique thing, and I, I'm just so touched that Maude, you, 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 you went ahead and verbalized this because we don't really hear a lot about this in the experimental writing community, but the, uh, there was an, there's an element of sort of kindness and like the ability to be vulnerable and take risks and be messes and, you know, in the way that the, we, we, these, this, these conversations have circulated um, that allows certain kinds of discoveries to happen that are organic and flowing because there isn't like domination, there's exploration and, um, and openness. So I just wanted to cycle back to this beautiful circle of words, attunement, bewilderment, bewilderment attention and care. Anyone else can jump in there too, or change the subject. <laughs> Who knows what third thing might emerge from that? And this notion of bewilderment is, is a tough one for a prose writer, particularly a novelist. And one I'm increasingly coming into contact with um, 
and ha having to having to find some comfort within. Uh, you never know. You 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 think you know the story, and then each day you in, in, enter the story, the story changes around you, and that can be tremendously discomforting, <laughs> uncomfortable, discomforting. Um, but increasingly in my writing practice, I have taken a great deal of joy in just trying to discover a picture instead of making one. And and that, I don't know if anybody else in the room too, I know Bev is a writer as well, and Elizabeth, a wonderful poet. If that's something that is common to the poetic practice that perhaps we could, us prose writers could learn something from. In my class, we go awkward turtle. You remember that? The awkward turtle. It's so 10 years ago in class. Wow. Anyone else? Any other question? Bev, you had you have something. Oh, I was having a flashback to uh, the early 70s, a bunch of uh, back to the landers in rural, very rural Maine gathered to uh, do a, a barn raising as a group of neighbors. And um, each morning before we began work, <laughs> we, we would do attunement. And we'd circle up and chant. Mm. And uh, only then would we begin work. <laughs> oh, so lovely. It might be a lovely image to really just to, to leave us on that physic the physicality of that raising the barn. <laughs> I'd like to thank all of our speakers today, uh, and and for this really unexpected collaboration that it happened when Sarah and I met, and then Sarah introduced me to all these artists, and I'm very happy to be able to bring them to you as part of the Altamesa Center reading series. Uh, you should check us out. Um, things that are upcoming. I'll put it on the board here so that you can see. There it is clicking around. Next, uh, next week we have uh, Maker Mentor Muse, which is an offshoot of our teaching offshoot of Alta Mesa is 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 hosting an online writing workshop about um, archives and family ancestry as a way of entering entering the work. All proceeds go to benefit. Um, the wildfires in, in Hawaii. So if you're interested in that, there's still time to uh, sign up and there is a link here. I'm teaching a class at a, at a left margin lit coming up at the end of the month, healing your relationship to the work, looking at art as a spiritual act, not merely as, as, a, as an act of craft um, too. And so this conversation has informed that, that class as well. I'm grateful for that. Next on Alta Mesa Center for the Arts, we're hosting Juliet Patterson and Toby Hiller. Um, Juliet's um, memoir, Sinkhole, A Legacy of Suicide, is, is brilliant. And Toby has impressed me year after year with her work, poetic and otherwise. So I hope that you will join us for that. The, the registration link is there. Um, Let's uh, go ahead and you clap virtually or take yourself off mute and, and let's give our, our readers uh, just a tremendous applause and, and gratitude from all of us. Many, many thanks. Thank you all. So beautiful. Thank you, everyone. Thank you so much for coming, people. Thank you. Thank you. And we're going to talk if you want to stick around, so. Thank Off you. Off camera. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you all. Thank I you. just wanted to say something to Sarah about this idea of cutting up words and moving them around, physically moving the words instead of erasing and writing and how, what an interesting process that sounds like. Yeah, it's like, it's like you, Midge. Midge is a brilliant um, knitter and 
crocheter. So I wanted to get all physical like you, like you get to do. <laughs> anyway, thank you for inviting me to this. Thanks so much for coming, Midge. Really, really great to see you here. Take care. <laughs>